I want to read to you some uh, selected verses from Philippians chapter 4. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who strengthens me. Yet, it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. They are a fragrant offering and acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Amen. Well, Brian told me I have about 25 to 30 minutes, so uh, if, if I'm still preaching in 30 minutes, I'm going to stop in mid-sentence and stop. <laughs> I'm just going to honor that, uh, that time uh, barrier. Well, the book of Philippians is my favorite New Testament book. It is filled with practical advice, and it's filled with lessons for life. It's obvious that the Apostle Paul has learned some lessons in life. He says in verses 11 and 12, I have learned to be content. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I haven't arrived there yet. I wish I could stand before you with integrity and say that's exactly the way that I feel about life. But, but I'm not there yet. And I'm thankful that Paul was able to be such a great example to us and to say that we can reach a place in our spiritual journey where we can be content whatever the external circumstances. But I want us to look at some really important lessons that I believe the book of Philippians has for each of us in chapters 3 and 4. I want to begin by looking at a paradigm for decision-making in life. Now, I want, I want all of you young people especially to hear this, but, but I want older folks to hear it too, because we often make life-changing decisions, and then we sometimes wonder whether we should have made that decision. Now, I have a basic principle in life that I've tried to teach my children and all of the youth in the churches that I've served. And generally speaking, if you make good decisions, you have good consequences. And if you make bad decisions, you have bad consequences. How many of you would believe that that 
generally speaking, that's a pretty good principle. Good decisions, good consequences. Bad decisions, bad consequences. Well, th this paradigm that I'm going to share with you comes from Paul's decision to follow Christ. The greatest decision he ever made. And I heard my Bible college president back in Ohio preach out of Philippians chapter 3 back in the 70s. And he made three points that have always stuck with me. And only later in life, as I looked at those three points, did I come to the conclusion, this is the greatest paradigm I've ever seen for making good decisions. And the first one is this. When we make decisions, we should have no reservations about that. Paul says in verses 7 and 8, Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In other words, saying I have no reservations about everything that I turn my back on to follow Jesus. None whatsoever. And then he says, not only do I have no reservations, I have no regrets. Listen to what he says in verse 8b. All those things that I left behind, I consider them rubbish that I may follow Christ. Now, many of you know that I've been a horseman for years, and um, I see Ted and Becky here, and I have great memories of Melinda and I going out to their farm, and they allowed us to uh, ride their horses, and what a great memory. Used to ride out at Jim and Judy Hunt's place occasionally. But I've had horses for years, and, and uh, we pull our horses to Colorado every summer. We've done that for the last 20 years. And we're going to be moving to Colorado this year by the grace of God. And then I'm going to ride those mountains and hunt. And I'm going to do some ministry in order to uh, keep my iron of fire in the life of the church. But you see, over the years, I've thrown a lot of horse manure out the back door of the barn. And that's exactly what Paul is saying in this. He's, he says, I consider everything that I've given up, I consider it as dung, as manure. It's just worthless to me. You see, the reality is, God wants us to make good decisions in life, and we should do it with no reservations and no regrets. And then he says, I have no retreats. Verses 13 and 14, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. See, the reality is, when we make big decisions in life, if we have reservations about it, we often end up having regrets. And then when we have regrets, we're often looking for a way to get out of the situation and we want to retreat. So if you want to make good decisions in life, follow this paradigm. No reservations, no regrets, no retreats. And then in verses 13 and 14, I see the, the second great lesson. I see a biblical principle for success. Now, I'm sure there's nobody here that remembers this, but this is the first sermon that I preached at the Monticello Church in June of 1985. A biblical principle for success. And here's the way it goes. Paul says that if we're going to be successful, we have to forget the failures of the past. You, you cannot be a success in life if you're constantly being drugged backward by your failures. If you have a what-if syndrome or an if-only syndrome, if, if only I hadn't done this, what if I had done something differently? You see, folks, that's a futile, that's a futile way to live your life. And Paul says we have to forget about the failures. You see, I know there are a lot of golfers in this uh, congregation. I think about Rory McIlroy last year at the Masters, the major meltdown. I felt so sorry for that kid when I saw him there in those last holes. He buried his, buried his face in his arm. I mean, major meltdown. But you know what? Just a few weeks later, he came back and won the U.S. Open. Because he was able to forget the failures of the past and focus. Listen, here's the second point. You need to focus with faith on the future. Paul says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. 
When we have issues in the past, we need to let them go. We need to look forward with faith, believing that God is going to give us a better future. And then finally, he says we need to be fervent and faithful in all of our present endeavors. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me upward in Christ Jesus. He's giving us a, a word picture of a runner who is straining with every ounce of strength toward the finish line. Young people, listen to me. If you want to be successful in life, you need to be fervent and faithful in all of your present endeavors. You might think, well, this is a little bit beneath me. I, I wish I was doing something better. If, if you do everything you do with excellence, somebody's going to be watching, and you're going to be the person targeted for that promotion. Forget the failures of the past. Focus with faith on the future. And be fervent and faithful in all of your present endeavors. I think the third lesson that I want to share this morning is we dare not ignore problems in the church. We dare not ignore problems in the church. Now, notice that Paul is addressing an issue in the Philippian church. He says, I plead with you, Odia. I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. And then he says, I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of Christ. You Odia and Syntyche, obviously Christian ladies, obviously dedicated to serving the Lord, and yet they're having a disagreement that they can't get resolved. And Paul is not going to ignore it. He's not going to act like it isn't there. There are a lot of folks in life that think if there's a problem, the best way to deal with it is just to turn your back and walk away. But folks, I'm here to tell you we dare not ignore problems. We need to get them resolved. See, here's the way it works. It takes honest communication. It takes honest confrontation. See, Jesus said it like this in Luke chapter 17, verse 3. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. That means confront him. If he turns and repents, forgive him. It's so simple, but yet hardly anybody does it. In fact, I want to guarantee you, if you look around in your workplace, whether you work in a factory or an office or wherever, here's exactly what people do. Someone perceives that they've been offended by a fellow worker, and instead of going and talking to that person one-on-one -on -one and getting it resolved, they go talk to everybody but that person. And they get their own little coalition of support behind them. And the next thing you know, you have an office war. How many of you have seen that? Come on. Come on. Yeah, a lot more. A lot more. Sure. See, the reality is we need to go talk to people one-on-one -on -one and get it fixed. Not only is it about honest communication and honest confrontation, it's about honest resolution. See, here's the deal. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of counseling over the years. The most damaging thing to any human relationship when there is a disagreement and a problem is for somebody to say it's okay when it's not okay. Did you hear what I said? For somebody to say it's okay when it's really not okay. You see, that's what the world does, and then they write the person off. You see, God doesn't give us that option. In the life of the church, when we have disagreements, we sit down and we resolve them, and we work together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Can anybody say amen? amen. May I say it louder? Amen. Come on, make me believe it. Amen. There you go. Number four, prayer is God's answer to anxiety. Prayer is God's answer to anxiety. Uh, listen to what Paul says in verses 6 and 7. Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Are you kidding me? Do not be anxious about anything. Are you for real, Paul? Life is filled with circumstances and situations that cause us to be anxious, to cause us to be concerned, to cause us to worry. So we need to understand, what is Paul actually saying here? 
I think what Paul is saying is when we do have those times in life, we, we allow our concerns and our worries, our anxieties to drive us to our knees in prayer. Because, you see, worry is just a way of burning a lot of negative energy. And one of the things that I know about anxiety is that the more anxious you are, the more anxious you become. It, it just spirals up to where, it, for some people, it gets completely out of control. You see, the reality is, if we let our anxieties drive us to prayer, we can do con something constructive with our energy. And that's to call on the name of the one with whom nothing is impossible. When everything looks hopeless from a human perspective, we call on the God of hope. Amen? The God who can do wondrous and miraculous things, even today. And so, when we have anxiety, the remedy is prayer and the result is God's peace. Notice what he says. If you will, by prayer and petition, request or re present your request to God, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, one of the things that I've often said, God has the ability to give us this kind of inexplicable peace. And even though we might not be able to explain it or express it adequately, we can experience it abundantly. Did you hear it? Even though we cannot express it or explain it adequately, we can experience it abundantly. I have three older sisters. The uh, all, all of my family's involved in serving the Lord except our youngest brother, Joe. He's the black sheep. He's the dope smoker, whiskey drinker, proud of it kind of a guy. I keep praying that he's going to get saved one of these days. My middle sis, Janet, was a pastor's wife for years and years. Janet has gone to be with the Lord. She, she was diagnosed with stage four uh, lung cancer a few years ago. Never smoked a cigarette in her life. Uh, Jan and Larry had uh, two boys and a girl. Their oldest son, Dwayne, was my deer hunting buddy. And uh, I have great memories of having great times out in the field with Dwayne. Uh, he called me a few years ago from his deer stand. Dwayne was going through some major problems in his life troubles. Uh, a few days later, on a Sunday, when Janet and Larry came home from church, there was a message on the answering machine, and it was Dwayne, and my sister Janet ran out and jumped in the car, ran up to Dwayne's house. It was close to uh, Halloween time, and, and when she pulled in the driveway, she thought Dwayne was actually playing a trick on her. He was sitting out at a picnic table in the backyard, and when she walked up on him, she realized that her firstborn had taken his head off with a deer slug. You, you can't imagine the grief. When, when we uh, left Indiana and got to Ohio, they were still cleaning up the backyard. I, I saw my brother-in-law, Larry, faithful to serve the Lord for years and years and years. I saw him get down on his knees and pick up the mulch under that picnic table with the blood of his son running through his fingers and I never heard such anguish in my life. Tough times. But I'm here to tell you that in the midst of all of this, there is a God that can give a peace that transcends human understanding. There is a God that can walk with us through the valley and help us to stay focused on the reality of the mountaintop in the future. There is a God who is able to work in our lives and help us when we feel absolutely hopeless and help us, helpless. Well, the next point is that God provides the power to get us through tough times. 
And you see, Paul says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And I know that many of you have experienced that, haven't you? Because in life we have troubles. Job says, as surely as sparks fly upward, man is born for trouble. I never, I never sit around a campfire without thinking of that great biblical truth. As you watch the sparks fly upward, we are born for trouble. We're going to experience trouble in life. And some of us are going to go a little further and experience some, some trials, some personal trials. And then some of us are going to walk through some deep valleys of tragedy, of pain, pain that you and I cannot express adequately with human words. And the reality is, is that we have a God who walks with us through those troubles and trials and even tragedies. A number of years ago, God gave me a, I, I believe, a, 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 an important thought about suffering and going through difficulties as a believer. Because so many Christians have this mistaken idea that if you serve Jesus, you're never going to have problems. And so years ago, I began to preach to my people that when we have problems in life, the wrong question is, why me? The wrong question is, why me? The right question is, why not me? What have I ever done so great that I should be exempt from suffering, especially since Millions of righteous men and women have suffered even to the point of death. I say, you know what? God served me well in March of 2010 when I noticed this little thing growing in my neck. Actually, it had been there for years. I couldn't tell you when I didn't have it, but one day I noticed that it was bigger. And so when, the, when my ENT doc cut it out. He said, I'm going to cut you on this wrinkle so nobody will know it. He did a great job. But uh, he told Melinda, he said it just kind of popped out in his hand. It was all encapsulated, not attached to anything. And he said, I don't think it's cancer. A week later, I'm sitting across from his desk and he tells me it's cancer. Uh, and I've gone through 35 radiation treatments that have fried my salivary glands. And, but the doc says I'm cancer free. But I want to give you my testimony. God served me well with that truth that he gave me a long time ago, that the wrong question is why, not, is why me? The right question is why not me? Because I'm here to tell you today in integrity, I never had one minute of emotional devastation through that whole ordeal. Because I knew where I was going if I died, I knew that there's a God who's going to walk with me through the valley and he's going to bring me out on the other side. And then the final lesson I want to give you just real quickly is that we can always rely on God's promise to provide. We can always rely on God's promise to provide. He says, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. But I want you to all notice something. Because I've heard that verse quoted over and over again in my life, and you have to see it in its context. Because the context of that promise is in the context of the Philippian church being a giving church. In fact, what Paul is saying is, because you were willing to give to me, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches. And you see, Melinda and I have found that out over our years together. I don't think you've ever heard this testimony, but when I came here in June of 1985, two teenage girls, 13 and 14, I had full custody of them. Never received a dime from their mother. Now, if she'd have gotten custody, do you think that would have been true from my side? It wouldn't have. When I came to this church with my two girls... 
I was 38 years old. I had $212 to my name, and I was $70,000 in debt. Did you hear what I said? I had $212 in my checkbook. That's all that I had. No CDs, no retirement, 70 grand in debt. Some of you may remember I asked Don if I could have a day off during the week so that I could work for someone else and I would work on Saturdays in the church. And so I went to work for Bob Overman that first Sunday putting roofs on houses. And then I started seminary that fall. Melinda and I have always been in the top percentile of givers in the churches that we've served. The Dayton Church, the St. Luke's Church, I think we've been in the top three givers of the whole congregation because you can't outgive God. And I'm here to tell you today that we have more than I ever dreamed that we would ever have because God is faithful to his promise that when we give, he will supply all of our needs. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> amen and amen.